for me. There have been so many aspects of the Master Gardener that I have been able to be involved in. There's many niches to fill with the Master Gardeners. You can work with youth, with children, with adults, in gardening, you can teach the answer clinic. And yes, we are open. The answer clinic is open for any of your questions. We are doing it long distance from our homes, but we are there for you. There's also propagating in the greenhouse for the Mother's Day sale that we missed this year and just really missed. And then there's Fort Vancouver Garden that you can work in. There's, you know, the welcome sign, welcome to Washington sign as you come in I-5 to Washington. Master Gardeners design and plant that every year, except this year, we weren't able to be able to get that done. And then there is learning on our part. There's sharing, giving, and even more learning on our part. The journey is just full and just as delightful. If you are interested or have that little urge to do it, do it, don't wait. Today, we are gonna talk about saving seeds. Saving seeds significantly reduces the cost of producing healthy foods with great flavors and gen genetic diversity. Every seed holds a connection to the future and the past. They are passed down from ancestors to us. Seeds connect us to our history, our culture, and our family. I have an Aunt Flossie that I have some uh, bean seeds from clear back in Missouri, and the label was dated 1920, and I still cherish those bean seeds. They're also great food for our bees and our pollinators, so let's get out there and let's just do lots of planting and harvesting for them. We are going to learn today Did I go quiet? We can hear you, Vion. I can't make my screen move. Can you go down to the goes. bottom? There, there it is. <laughs> Bless it. Okay, we are going to learn why we save seeds, terms that we need to learn and know, how to develop pure seeds. And we're gonna, pure seeds means they are really pure hybrids. Methods of creating pure seeds, Harvesting and storing of those seeds. Okay, why do we save seeds? It's very cost effective. You don't have to buy new seeds every year. Hybrids are very expensive and exclusive. They cannot be reproduced. Tip, and uh, Typically a seed package has say, oh, 50 seeds in it. You pay $3 for it. Transplant plant cost $3 to maybe $5. And if you buy a package of seeds and start them yourself, that's a lot of plants, a lot of tomato plants in that package of tomato seeds. We don't need 50 plants in our gardens. But if you save your own seed, no upfront cost, and you can plant just a few seeds of a lot of different varieties. Also, did you know that our plants that are locally grown are adaptive. They create their own genetic adjustments to our climates and our con the conditions, including resistance to the local pets and diseases. Why else? That's a good reason to save. Also, we are going to protect our heirlooms. Heirlooms are going, they were they're going extinct almost. We have less than 1% of the vegetable varieties available 100 years ago. In 1981, there were 5,000 non-hybrid vegetable varieties. In 1998, just 17 years later, it dropped from 5,000 to 600. Just a handful of companies own 98% of the world's food seed sales. And they are coming up with a lot of hybrids so many of our heirlooms, they actually have been lost. In Peru, it was the birthplace of the potatoes as a crop. At one time, there were over 4,000 varieties of potatoes in Peru. Now, even in regions of Peru that aren't affected by the modern markets, only a few dozen are grown. 
there has been a wonderful upsurge of interest in the past 15 or so years. We have a lot of people working to find heirloom seeds from different sources to rescue, protect, and make them available to us. Many seed catalogs now have heirloom seeds, but be careful because the technical term for heirlooms is a 50-year-old generation, but that is not a hard rule, so be aware. There are some great seed saving groups out there that have a great time exchanging seeds. One of you could even start one. Sounds fun, huh? Seed Savers Exchange is a great source of information and learning. And you'll find that in seedsavers.org or just look up Seed Savers Exchange. There's a lot of information that they have in there. Your seed packets also will state usually that they are heirlooms, but that's not a tried and true thing. There, and then there are seed vaults. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever looked up the uh, seed vault. It's a worldwide gathering source of heirloom seeds in Spitzenberg, Norway. It's actually a natural cave that is permafrost 18 degrees as it generally all the time. And they have made it into a high security reinforced cement and earthquake proof, we hope, um, area that can store 4.5 million varieties of heirloom seeds. And that's up to 2.5 billion seeds that can be stored there for, so we are, people are working wonderfully to help bring back our heirlooms and keep them safe. And then some of you might even have your personal seed vault. Know that those seed vaults, usually you can't store the seed for more than five years before it starts becoming not viable. And then we have our personal satisfaction. You can share the results of your labors with your gardeners or keep those for your generations coming. You also have insect control, in, insecticide control that you can use with saving your own seeds. Important reasons why to save seeds. Okay, let's look at our flower structure. It's important to understand the flower structure so that we can know what we, why we are creating and what we are doing. Flowers on our plants are for reproduction and to generate their species. And there's the male part is called the stamen and it has the anther and the filament holds the pollen. And the female part is called the pistil, and it includes the stigma, the style, the ovary and ovules. And then um, pollen will touch the stigma from the filament, from the male plant. And then it goes in the tube, in the style, it's a tube that goes down right, travels right down that tube to the ovary and enters the ovules. And then it develops the future seeds in those ovules. Now there is such a thing as a, a perfect flower, and that is a flower that itself holds both the male and the female reproduction in itself. It pollinates itself. And then there's the mono, mo, monoecious, and that is the, the flower that has the male and female reproduction in the same plant. It doesn't depend on insects or wind for pollination. The self-pollinating monoecious are, uh, examples are like lettuce, pepper, carrots, eggplants. They can all, they have the, the flowers that can self-pollinate each other. And the dioecious, that is each flower is only a male or a female flower on a plant. And that needs insects or wind for pollination. And you have that in the Kirkabit family, which is the squash and the, um, the, the, those sort of families. And then there's corn and spinach that have to be um, uh, uh, wind pollinated. And then there's asparagus and spinach. Those plants only have a female plant or a male plant. They don't, don't have the mixed flowers on the plant. Okay, understood. Is there any questions that anybody has about any of this so far? There are no questions so far. I'm watching for them. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, now let's talk genetics. 
heirlooms. They are in the public domain. They are there for us to use. They generate natural selection. Carrots began from Queen Anne's lace, and some of the Queen Anne's lace family are toxic, but people saved the best root seed through many generations so that through the years of saving the best, we now have our tasty ones. Love those crisp carrots. Open pollinated heirlooms are created by natural selection. Through our seed saving, we can reproduce the best characteristics of their generation. And that's one of the reasons why when we save seeds, we look for the best plants, the biggest, the ones that, that uh, blossom and, and do their things early, just good, strong plants. That way we are keeping those good characteristics. Look at some of our um, open pollinated varieties, such like tomatoes. We've got Big Rainbow, Marzano, Brandywine, among lots of others. Uh, the peppers, we've got habaneros, California Wonder, peas, Lincoln, Little Marble, Perfection, <clears throat> beans, Kentucky Wonder, Blue Lake, Tender Crop, all of those are wonderful, wonderful heirlooms. And now our hybrids, they have been around since 1920. And they're offspring of a cross between parents of varieties, usually the same species. And let's understand the species is like a species would be a, a broccoli. And then you had varieties of that broccoli, like the beans has Kentucky Wonder, Blue Lake, and Tender Crop. Those are varieties, whereas beans is the species. Okay. And anyway, these are usually offspring of a cross between parents of varieties, usually the same species, that are genetically different. And those most often are deliberately done to create desired traits. Hybrids, uh, as most of you know, most of our vegetables in our grocery store have been bred for commercial use so that they have uniform appearance, they look good, that they're mechanized harvest, they all harvest at the same time, so they're quicker and easier to harvest, convenience of packaging, and a tolerance for hard travel, so they don't get bruised and, and whatnot as they travel long distances. F1 is the label that you'll see on some of your things, and that means that's the first generation of the hybrid. And it takes about 10 years to be able to genetically bring that back to its original species or variety. Um, I meant variety. And its offspring, you can't always, you can't harvest your hybrids because of the seeds, because it will revert back to one of those parents, but not both. It will not go back to its hybrid like it is when you first pick it. It will always revert back and back and back. So sometimes it's not even edible or it's tasteless. It just isn't as good a plant. So you cannot save the seeds from your hybrids. Now let's look at our pollinating terms. We have, uh, you need to be sure and research your plant because you want to save the seeds and know what its pollination habits are so it can be viably saved. You have open pollination. These are non-hybrid plants and they're produced by crossing two parents of the same variety which produce offspring just like the parent. Sometimes you can shake the plant when it's full bloom and aid in the pollination. Then you have to buzz like a bee. For really true seeds there might be a need to isolate the plant and, or you only grow one variety. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit here. Okay, and then there's self-pollination. This accepts pollen from itself. It trans the transfer of pollen from anther to stigma on the same flower or a different flower of the same plant. They can depend, be depended upon to become true to their parents almost all of the time. This includes your barley, lima beans, snap beans, cowpeas, endive, lettuce, oats, peas, soybeans, tomatoes, wheat. Most of your tomatoes are self-pollinated except for, they call them the potato leaf varieties. 
which is stupis is one of the names, S-T-U-P-I-C-E. It has a protruded anther, and so it can cross-pollinate more uh, with other varieties. Okay, and then you have cross-pollinated, which is the crossing between varieties by transfer of pollen from another, from the anther of another plant to the stigma by wind or insects. Your corn and your squash will cross-pollinate with their varieties, and this can affect their flavor. It's at like, for instance, with your corn, if you know enough about gardening, you plant your corn in a block because the pollen on their, the top pollen shafts, when they bloom, they rain down their pollen onto the silk of the corn, and then that uh, pollen will travel to each individual little kernel, and that becomes the seeds. That's what, if we didn't have the pollination, they would not develop those kernels. But that's why you don't want them to cross with another variety. It, it might change that flavor. Is there any questions now? No questions yet, own. Oh, either they understand it or I've got them completely confused. Okay, let's go on. Now we are going to talk about how to create true seeds, and I'm calling them true seeds, which means they are true heirlooms uh, when you get done with them. For the best genetics, again, choose the earliest and biggest plants and harvest the seed from several plants. Don't just do one because you're going to have uh, then better diversity in, in the best of your plants. The easiest vegetables to save if you're a beginner and want to start saving seeds are beans, chicory, endives, lettuce, peas, tomatoes, herbs. The easiest flowers to save seeds from are foxglove, nasturtiums, hollyhocks, sweet peas, zinnias, and these are just some. There's lots, lots, lots more out there. But let me tell you about zinnias. There was a, a, one of the workers down at Fort Vancouver had been working out in the garden and she noticed the zinnias and they were just beautiful. And she decided that she, that she was going to save those seeds and have a color wheel next year. And so, because of the colors were so vibrant, she could just see those, those spokes of that wheel coming out and, and having all those flowers look so beautiful. So she diligently saved all of those seeds, very carefully labeled them with the color kept them separate and everything so that she could have that color wheel. And then the next year when she planted them, was so excited and when they started blooming, they were as diversified as they were the year before. Why? Because they had cross pollinated so their colors were all mixed. So that, just learned that lesson from that story. It was a lot of fun hearing her story of how she didn't do it, she blew it. Okay, so we have our families which do not need any help with our pollinization. We can just let them grow, come to their maturity and harvest their seeds. And some of those are like peas and beans, lettuce, tomatoes, except the potato leaf variety and peppers. Those are the very easiest to start with and need no help from us. Okay, now if we're going to plant another seed that might cross pollinate, or you want to absolutely not have the variety, you want to have the original variety, you need to do isolation. And what this is, is you're going to plant it away from the rest of the garden so, so that you make sure that you don't have it pollinated by any other plants of the carrots family. And so you will just move it away a ways. And now on um, the um, site that I told you about Seed uh, Savers Exchange, they have a wonderful chart that has all the varieties and it has the distances because they all have different distances that they can still pollinate other plants. So if you want to do that, just check that out on Seed Savers Exchange. It's really quite a great one. And then we have by isolation. What we do here is we can plant it in our garden there. We would just plant one variety. You wouldn't plant like three or four cabbage plants, different varieties. You wouldn't plant three or four um, 
uh, carrots or any of those things, you, or your peas, anything. Well, your peas don't cross pollinate that much, but anyway, you would just only plant that one variety if you weren't going to isolate it by distance. And then you would have your true seeds that you could save from those plants. And then you can do by isolation. And that means you will find, figure out by study, by research, when they blossom. And you can plant the first ones and, and know that when they're blossoming, when you could, whatever time span between the growth of the plant and the blossoming, you can time to plant the next plants and the next so on, so that you can have different varieties, but they aren't going to be blooming at the same time, so they're not going to be pollinated at the same time. So they will not do any cross-pollinating. And then we have the fun hand pollinating. And these are absolutely, you have to uh, be so careful with these because they real that your Kirkabit family really does cross-pollinate easily and does not make true seeds. So on the one on the left, top picture there shows you there are two different flowers that are on the squash plant. And you can definitely see the male plant is long straight stem and the female plant has that little beginning of the little plant of the her uh, squash plant. And so you can definitely see the difference. If you look at the inside of the flower, the bottom flower has the uh, stamen for the the um the female flower the stigma i'm sorry the stigma on the female flower is completely different than the picture in the middle is the male flower with the uh, anther full of pollen there so you need to know that and so so what you're going to do is you're going to go out in the evening and kind of observe your plants that you think are going to be open the flowers that are going to be opening the next morning and you will carefully uh, keep that little plant closed, close it with a um, paper clip if it's a small blossom. If it's a bigger one, um, you can do it with a, a, a rubber band, a piece of string. You can do it with a um, clothespin, anything to keep those, both the male and the female blossom closed so that there will be no insect pollination inside those to do any cross pollinating. So in the morning, then you're going to go out there and you are going to remove the barrier that you put on those blossoms and pick the male flower. And then you will make sure that that anther then is in complete contact with the stigma on the female plant. Here again, if you're going to do this, you've got to buzz like a bee and be that little pollinator. And then you will close up that little female flower and Put, again, put a barrier on it, like I said, a clothespin, a rubber band, anything to tie that and keep it closed. And in the next few days, she will die down and um, be able to start producing her true seeds and her plant. Now, it's really important that you put something, mark it with a string, with yarn, whatever, something colorful that you can see. You mark on the stem of that plant that it was one of your hand pollinated plants because next uh, when you go to harvest them you're not going to remember which one and you don't want to pick the ones that need to ripen completely so be sure that you mark it and you know what it is and then you will leave that to grow to its maturity so that you can harvest those seeds and that's a fun thing to do Okay, and then we have two seeds by barrier. And this is a lot more labor intensive. Um, you need to, one of them, the first one is bagging. And this is for plants that need insect or wind pollination. And you bag it before the flower opens, and then you will pollinate it by hand with the paintbrush or whatever, again, buzz like a bee as a pollinator, and then you'll rebag it. And when the flowers die, then you can remove the bag because there won't be any more pollinating being done. Be sure again to mark it so that you know those are the ones that you did pollinate. And then there's the caging. And this is, this is if you're really serious. Uh, you can do the entire plant or groups of plants, cover them with a frame, 
and, uh, and insect barrier. And then you have to get some pollinators and you have to put them in the screen for the day. If it's honeybees, I don't know how you're gonna do it, but you'll put them in there and then you need to let them out to be able to go back to their hive in the night, in, in the afternoon or evening. Or you can take the cage and you can move it from plant to plant. You can keep one co covered for several days and then you can move it in, um, in another few days to let the, it be pollinated. So it's, this is something you've got to be real serious to, to be able to do on. But not me, I'm not doing that. Okay, and now for collecting the seed, we need to know what are annuals, perennials, and biennials. That's really important. Annuals are one season. That means they grow and they blossom and make their seeds in that same season. And some of those are like onions, brassica family, which is the, cucumber, the um, um, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, all those. Lettuce, squash, peas, and, and beans. You all know what those are because we eat them in the same year and they, and they will blossom that same year. Okay, now perennials. They are plants like the asparagus that stay in the ground and they, don't, they will make their seeds year after year. Uh, then your biennials. Your biennials, they need a winter chill. So they grow the first year and we harp, we, then they die down for the winter and then they make their seeds the next year, their blossoms and seeds the next year. And that, believe it or not, that is carrots. Carrots have to bloom the second year. Beets have to bloom the second year. Your, um, um, anyway, the parsnips are the same thing. Okay, so when you're doing your seed saving, you're collecting your seeds, be sure to label with the variety, the name of the plant, the variety, and the date that you collected it. And if it's flowers, be sure that you put the color of the flower there also. And then you need to know what kind of seeds your plant has. The dry seed heads is your carrots, your herbs, onions, zinnias, foxgloves. And then there's this, my story of the trillium. We were up in the mountains gathering black caps and just enjoying life and, and tasting those as we were picking them. And we sat down for our picnic lunch. And I was sitting there eating my sandwich and I happened to look over to the side of me. And here was a trillium plant that had gone to seed. And I was thrilled because you can't dig up trilliums. You can't transplant them. So I saw those seeds and I harvested some of them. They, they were really pretty little seeds with this kind of a gel-like surrounding on each seed. And I took some of them, left some of them there, and took some of them and wrapped them in my napkin and took them home and, and carefully took them out and put them on the, a plate to, to let them dry out. And then a, a couple days later, I thought, well, I need to just look up on these seeds, look back up in my book on these seeds and, and just see what I need to do next. And I open it up and I start reading about trilliums and it talks about the gelatin on the outside. And then it said, do not let these seeds dry out. And I knew I'd killed some babies. I felt so bad. Those trilliums were gone. And I, it just oh, broke my heart. And I, then I read on that, that gel was to protect them until their planting time, until they fall off. That's how they got transplanted, was the birds would pick them to eat the gel off the top, and then they'd drop them somewhere else. And then the ants also love to carry these trillium seeds to their nests and feed off of them. And then they were done with the yummy, outside and then they bring them out and they kick them out of their their home away they didn't want them anymore and so they kick them out so that they would then reseed themselves but it's a good lesson to know your seeds and what their harvest time is and how to harvest them so be sure you do go to your resources and figure those out and then there's the dry inside pod this is your peas, beans, radishes, broccoli, all those grow inside pods. 
and you need to know when they are ready to be harvested. And then you have your wet seeds. And this is your squash, your tomatoes, your cucumbers, your melons, all those that have the wet flesh inside. They all need to be harvested differently. And then we're going into our harvest. Again, I stated before, choose vigorous, healthy, and disease-free plants. Keep an eye on them and know the ones that you're going to harvest the seeds from. The ripeness of the seed may not be when the plant is at its most edible stage. For instance, beans. We don't care to eat them when they get bigger unless we want the hard, dry beans. And so you need to know when that they are not at their, at their prime harvesting time. Uh, sometimes we have to compete with and keep eyes on birds and critters till the stuff is fully mature for harvesting. And then um, note also that like for instance, the lettuce that is the picture here on this, those uh, seeds, they will flower and seed at the same time. So when you're going to harvest those, you would want to take a paper bag with you and just bend the plant over and shake it into the paper bag and then let it stay. You don't pick the whole head of the flower stem because they will continue to produce seeds as they go along. So on the dry harvest, you're going to cut the stems when the weather is dry and do it after the dew has disappeared. You want no dampness or wetness on these seeds. And then you'll take these dry harvest ones and tie, I tie them in a bunch together, hang them indoors where it's dry and dark and cool. And you will hang those so that they will dry completely. Be careful when you pick them because sometimes the seeds dislodge really fast. So it's kind of nice to have a bag that you can drop those seed heads into as you're picking them sometimes. I carry bag, uh, brown paper bags with me to do that. And sometimes uh, you will want to put a cloth on the ground underneath where you're hanging them or place a paper bag around them where you're hanging them to catch the seeds that might fall out so you don't lose all those that you're trying to harvest. It's really important to remove the shaft completely so that you don't leave any debris with the seeds when you are storing them away. You can do that by winnowing, which is if the seeds are heavy enough, you could um, kind of toss them into the air and let the wind blow them away. Some people use a little bit of a, of a fan. Uh, if the seeds are too um, um, lightweight, you've got to be really careful with that. Or you can rub them between your hands to knock the seeds out of them. And, or you can sieve them. Sometimes they're fall, fine enough and small, small enough that they'll fall through that sieve and leave their debris out. But you need to try, try and remove, you may sit in front of the TV in the evening and be picking out all the shaft out of all those little seeds so that you have them nice and pure if they're little tiny seeds. And then um, you have the seed pods in the garden. And these are your peas and beans and those like that. When pods are very full and turn brown and dry on the vine, that's when you pick them and you remove the husks and then keep them indoors out of the sun and heat until they are completely dry. And if you have trouble with weevils in your area, which I haven't had, uh, you can place them in the freezer for 24 to 30 hours before you store them. And now we have our wet seeded plants. And these are, they are at the ripest and maturest at different times. So they all have different methods. Your squash, you would let the vine die and then store it in a cool, dark place for two months. Then you can split it out, scrape out the seeds, rinse the seeds with warm water to separate all the fleshy residue, spread it out on a glass or metal plate. Don't dry it on a paper plate or a napkin because it will stick to them. Now, some people I do know spread their seeds out and let them dry and then they use that, they just plant them with the paper towel. But I prefer 
to put them on a glass or metal plate and let them air dry away from the sun and the heat for about a week, and then I can put them in my container to store them. Now your cantaloupe, you store it fully ripe indoors. Now this is not one you buy at the store. This is one that you yourself have saved and made sure that the seeds are pure and, and keep it indoors as long as possible for about 20 days. The fruit will soften and actually show some signs of rot. Then you know that it's at its prime. You cut it open, scrape out the seeds, and again, do the same thing, rinsing them with water to remove the pulp, separating them on, on a glass or metal plate, and store them on the counter for a week, about a week until it is thoroughly dry, not in the sun or in the heat. Cucumbers, okay, you know they're inedible. They're fully ripe, those yellow little cucumbers out in the garden that you forgot to pick. It's aged and you harvest it then and you cut it open, scoop out the seeds and do the same thing as you did with the squash and the cantaloupe to clean them. Okay, and then there's peppers. Those peppers are only at their, their fullest maturity when they have turned red and have begun to shrivel on the plant. Then they are ready to harvest. Now we are going to see a little video about how Aria, Erica is going to show us one that shows how to ferment and harvest tomato seeds. and red and it's fullest maturity but not soft and mushy yet and then you'll cut the tomato with an x in the bottom with your knife just like that then you will turn it upside down into your little jar with the seed with the water in it and you will squeeze those into your jar now the tomatoes you'll notice they have a gelatin-like coating that surrounds each seed. This coating protects the seed while it's inside the fruit. The coating will need to be removed for storage, uh, but don't waste that tomato. You can make salsa or some, use it in a salad or even a sandwich, don't throw it away. To remove the coating, you will need to for ferment the seeds. In nature, the tomatoes ripen, then fall off the plant. It lays on the ground and begins to rot. This rotting is what removes the gel coating from the seeds. We need to duplicate this process, but in a faster method. To accomplish this, you will fill the glass with water that you have your seeds in, and then you will put the lid on it, sit it on your counter for two to three days. As it sits there, it is going to ferment it. And if, during those days, you will take it and you will shake it and manipulate it around a little bit and you will see the seeds will lose their gelatinous coating. If they float to the top, they are not viable seeds, they're hollow. They will actually, some of it will ferment on the top. The pulp will raise to the top and ferment. After it is set, and you can see that those seeds have lost that film that's surrounding them, then you will take it and you will pour it into a sieve and you will see those seeds that are in there, still in the jar even, and they have lost all of that gelatin that has formed. After you have um, strained them, and wash them, you can, you can even see some of the pulp that's still in there a little bit and you just pull that pulp out that might be in there or rinse it off, you can rinse it right off. Once you have done that with your seeds, then you're going to take them straining all that fun, wonderful stuff off and then you will put them on a paper towel and then just damp them off with your paper towel. Get them just as dry as you can and then put your seeds 
on a plate. Do not put them on a paper plate. Do not put them on paper towels because then they will stick to it. And if these had been washed with water, they'd be a lot easier to, for me to manipulate. Move them around a little bit so they're not touching each other. And then you will actually leave those on your counter again for two or three days. Move them around a little bit so that they are gonna dry really thoroughly. You do not store wet seeds. You, they have to be completely dry. After that, then you can take them off and we're gonna learn more about how to store them in a bit. But that's how you would ferment your seeds from your tomato to make them viable for planting. Okay, now we're gonna talk about storage. <laughs> your seeds are alive and they must be stored carefully and properly away from heat, moisture, and bugs. They're the enemies. And never dry them in the sun, never let them sit in the sun. They must be totally dry. Sort out all the debris and we talk about how to do that because there, there are sometimes those little, ends, little things in there, the seeds or the debris that we don't want in with those seeds. Be sure that you label with your plant name, your variety, the date and the color if it's flowers. Use paper envelopes and not plastic to store your seeds. I've seen some people that have had their seeds in little plastic zip bags and that, don't do that. Um, there's glassine paper envelopes and in the next slide you'll see my little envelopes that I have made out of glassine that you can order online from um, the uh, a source anyway. And uh, it's really, they really work best. Um, I've also taken envelopes, mail, letter envelopes that you would send in the mail, and I've cut them in half because one is way too big for most seeds, and then just uh, glued the edge down that had the glue on the flap, and then put the seeds in, and then folded the top down, and then taped it shut. Um, you can do it that way. You can make your own little envelopes out of paper. Just make sure that they are paper. And it's really best to store them in glass. I have stored them in, I had a um, ammunition can that I thought was a great thing. And then I read up, it says that metal isn't the best thing to store them in. So I thought, oh, the lid goes down and it's dark and it's great. It'll work wonderful. But no, it's better to be stored in glass. And you can, if you don't have a dark place to store them, you could even cover, cover them with black paint, the jars, or you could wrap some black um, construction paper around it. Um, just make sure that it's uh, in a cool, dark, dry area. And you can freeze them also. Most seeds can be frozen. Um, don't, uh, be careful of temperature fluctuations. That will shorten the life of your seeds. Don't store it in a room that gets warm and cold and warm and cold. It, it doesn't do them any good. You can freeze, uh, like I said, or keep it in an area that is um, 32 to 41 degrees is an okay temperature for the seeds. Be sure that the seeds are completely, completely um, dry because putting them in the freezer, if they are moist at all, it will burst them and destroy them. When seeds are harvested in the flower head, be sure that you do make sure that they are dry because seed heads will often hold some moisture in them. So completely dry the seeds before you store them. Um, Short-lived storage seeds. Uh, for one to two a year, you can store corn, parsley, parsnips, peppers, that sort of thing. Intermediate storing, which means three to four years, you can, um, that's asparagus, beans, carrots, broccoli, celery, leeks, peas, those can be three to four. Those that are the long, longest lived storage seeds, four to five years, is your beets, your chard, your turnip, your cabbage family, um, your radish, cucumbers, eggplants, lettuce, melons, tomatoes, squash. Those can be uh, stored for up to five years, four to five years. Now, after you have stored your plants, there is a test for germinating, if germination. If you don't know, what the germination, whether they're, if they've been maybe where you thought was maybe too warm or it's been several years and you're worried about um, whether they are viable or not, the test for germinating them, you will take 
20 seeds, about 20 seeds, which is a good ratio. And you'll moisten two to three layers of paper towels and lay, place those seeds and I separate them out so I can easily see them and then roll that paper towel up, the wet paper, damp, damp paper towels, you don't want them too wet, but the damp paper towels, roll them up, place them in a plastic bag and keep it in a warm place in the kitchen. And then observe every two days or so, check them for the percentage of germination. When they start germinating, just watch if they've mostly germinated, you've got really good viable seeds. If it's 75, like you've got 15 out of the 20 that have germinated, then it's like 75%. If only half of those, 10 of them have, have done um, germinated, then you know that it, they're only 50% and so on down to a quarter, uh, 25%. Don't throw them away. Do not throw them away. Even if you have 25%, just know that you can go ahead and plant those seeds really thick because one out of four is going to live. So uh, just, just know that you will plant them a little bit closer and a little bit um, thicker. Okay, so now don't forget, use the glass jars if at all possible. And I store mine in the freezer. And then um, and you can see my little jar there with the black and white, that's my Aunt Flossie's Missouri beans, shell beans that she has left me. Um, that has been fun to propagate those. And then the, the little envelopes in the front are the glassine envelopes that work really, really good. Be sure to label them, don't forget. Okay, I'm going to take you to my sources. Seed to Seed by Susan Ashworth is a really good one. It's got lots of good information in it. The New Seed Starters Handbook is another good one. Go check them out of the library. If they seem like these are books you need to have, then you can order them on Amazon. Seed Sowing and Saving by Carol B. Turner. And then I can't say enough about Seed Savers Exchange. They are just wonderful source of information. And lots of, they, they're always teaching and you can take, just get information off there. Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds is another place. And, um, I know Johnny Seeds has a good place that, that has some heirloom seeds and territorial. Some of the catalogs are starting more and more and more to carry them. And then uh, there's some good information on Washington State University and, and University of Oregon, which um, all you have to do is go onto their site and write in under the Master Garden Program, saving seeds or air, uh, anything like that, collecting and storing seeds, anything like that is gonna take you to their source that has got lots of good, and a lot of information that I have told you tonight, I got from those sources. And so we have learned why saving seeds, why we save seeds, terms that we needed to know, developing pure seeds and methods of saving true seeds and harvest and storage of seeds. Any questions? Yes, the question is, can we save seeds from grocery store produce? No. No, and the reason why is that they have not probably been picked at their prime. They are probably hybrid, and so their seeds will not be viable. And you just have to be able to pick them at their prime maturity, which those aren't usually. They're picked prior to uh, prime maturity because they want them to be crisp and nice um for us to eat so no you cannot you really have to uh, either somebody that you know trade seeds with them <clears throat> or harvest your own seeds for true seeds good question another question is why do you think that my poppy seeds all but one did not come back this year hmm hmm Have she, i wonder if she's been saving seeds other years and they've worked fine Sometimes it's climate. <clears throat> Sometimes they just, I don't know. That's a good question. <clears throat> that takes some research to find out. Um, just try and save the seeds again and try it again. Maybe they weren't stored. Maybe if they weren't stored where they uh, had fluctuation of heat, that does damage to them. Maybe. I don't know, she'd obviously be able to see if insects got into them. Interesting, I don't know. 
Good question. There's another question that says, how long do you wait after taking seeds out of the freezer to plant? I just leave them in until I'm ready to plant and just, just bring them out and let them room temperature. So then there's a question that says, I saved seeds from a grocery store, red and orange bell peppers. I planted them this year. Will they be red or yellow? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> that, will be, that will be something you need to get back to us on. That would be interesting to see. Have they been blooming? I wonder. And then there's a question that says, are most store-bought seedlings F1 or first generation? Uh, most of them are. They should say on it somewhere that they are an F1 or even ass, but most of them pretty much have to be. Um, they do do other genetics with them, you know, to bring up others, but uh, they should say on them whether they're an F1 or not. If not, I, you know, the hybrids are a hybrid. Can you um, indicate which seeds have to be put in the freezer so that they will germinate? Almost all of them. Um, if, you, if you do any, I've not had any problem with any seeds that I, I have frozen. Uh, there might be some that are, that are more um, out there that I don't know about. And can you use vacuum packing to save seeds that are clean and dry? Yeah, that wouldn't be a problem with it. Okay, does leaving the only, the, you know, I'm gonna back up on that. When you vacuum pack them, they're packed in, or in plastic, aren't they? That would be, yeah, I, I wouldn't do it. So there's a question that says, does leaving fruit to ripen fully on the plant stop the plant from producing a crop? Oh, I see what you mean. Like, for instance, leaving a, a, a pepper on a, a pepper plant to let it mature. And it does start slowing down, yes, because that's its purpose. When it says it's made its seeds, then it does stop producing more. So you'll want to save one that's later in the season uh, because it will do that. So then there's a question that says, with broccoli seeds, how long do you leave the pods on? On broccoli, uh, you know, it's just let them, uh, they will pop open and start losing their seeds. So um, just be careful and just try and make sure if they're really brittle and they're, they're ready to put, pick. If they're brown and brittle, you can go ahead and pick them because they will start opening up and curling out. Okay, and I think we'll go with one more. And this is back to when you were talking about hand pollination. It says, did you say to close the male and female flower the night before opening, then hand pollinate and snip the male and tie the female closed? Yes, yes, you want to keep those, if they were to open up a little bit early, if you didn't close them up the night before, they could be contaminated by an insect accidentally before you got to them. So you close both of them up and then the next morning take that off and make sure that they, you know, they're opening then while you're there you can kind of pull them open and then do the pollinating with the male and you can throw the male flower away then because it's done and then the uh, female you will close it back up until it dies okay well Viol, we want to thank you very much for your time and energy on this it's been excellent and i want to thank everyone else for attending saving seeds from the home garden webinar We'll be offering additional webinars throughout the summer. For example, on July 20, we'll be offering Growing a Greener Green Lawn, and on August 3rd, starting an herb garden. So if you'd visit our website, you can keep track of the different offerings that we have coming up. And you can also re, uh, review today's recording on our video section. So if you uh, do an internet search for WSU Extension Clark County Master Gardeners, you'll find all of the items that we have um, coming up as well as those videos. So thank you very much and have a great evening.